Piece of cake, man. Okay, everybody, so today we're going to cover the do's and the don'ts of Altissimo playing for saxophone. I feel like in my videos I've talked about some of these things, but perhaps I did not emphasize the importance of some things over others. And I watched through some people's YouTube videos and they mentioned my name. And I'm like, ah! But I see that they haven't done some of the things that are critical that I've talked about. So in this video, I'm going to cover the do's and don'ts of altissimo playing. <laughs> I'm also using my Supertone Master Autolink mouthpiece. This is a number seven. I am deliberately using this mouthpiece because it is nothing special. And also people think, oh, well, if you don't have a high baffle, you can't play altissimo. Nonsense. These are actually one of the best uh, mouthpieces to learn altissimo on because you can't really cheat. So the facing generally refers to the length of the facing, I'll explain that, and the facing curve. So the length of the facing is how long to the tip where the mouthpiece actually creates separation from the reed. That point where the reed separates from the mouthpiece is the starting point up to the tip. And the curve is just everything. The curve isn't always the same for every mouthpiece. So the facing length, the facing curve, the tip opening, your reed strength, and even your reed brand is going to play a big role in what kind of resistance, how much energy you have to apply just to get the thing to oscillate. And if it's really high, you're just going to get really tired and not be able to play. If it's too low, you're not going to get a very good sound, and ultimately you're just going to wind up sealing the reed to the mouthpiece. There are many people that I have played with that I have heard that use synthetic reeds and their altissimo is really, really good. I am not one of these people. And as far as my recommendation goes, as far as learning altissimo, really perfecting it, really getting good, don't learn with synthetic reeds. Use K. There are some features here that I want to point out that are gonna make a difference. And these are things I'm gonna be very transparent with you. When I did not have these things, I struggled playing altissimo. When I had my old Martin, that's the, that's the sax I'm playing in the video where I got my shirt off, the neck on that one is less angular and I struggled playing altissimo. I got my first cannonball saxophone shortly after that. I had the two of them at the same time. And when I swapped the necks, I put the cannonball neck on the Martin and altissimo was easy. Almost all modern saxophones, tenor saxophones anyway, are designed with this type of curvature in the neck. If it's less angular, personally, I struggled with it for a long time. Make sure you get a mouthpiece teeth protector. Even on mouthpieces that have a bite plate, I never, ever play a saxophone that does not have one of these cushions on here. I never do. With clarinet also, I never ever do that. This is something that's really important if you want to get into playing altissimo because you need to learn what to do with your embouchure. I don't talk about the importance of this enough. I never play saxophone without these things. So this is the Selmer teeth and mouthpiece protector ones. I've never seen this online. I've only seen these in brick and mortar music stores. When I go to buy these, they come on this piece of paper in these little baggies. Don't go through an airport with those little baggies. <laughs> and there's like three of them in that pack and they're all like stuck on that piece of paper. I go there and I buy the whole thing. I take the whole thing off and I buy it. A good indication that your embouchure is too tight is if you're just chewing through these things rapidly. It usually takes me about five or six months to go through one of these, so I'm set for a long time. 
If you like this kind of content, ladies and gentlemen, and you want to support the channel, you can buy me a piece of cake. This is like buy me a coffee, but since everything is a piece of cake. How are you today, sir? Very fine. I thank you, sir. Ding dong ding. <laughs> it's like uh, one of these Patreon Kickstarter type things. You make a donation and that really helps the channel grow. Also, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I am moving all of my digital content to a different platform. I'm going to leave both of them up for now. But if you check my stuff out on the new one, which is PayHip, the price of the digital stuff is actually going to be lower. Eventually, I might move everything. But for right now, I'm in the process of moving that. So take advantage of these discounts with my own personal stuff. Okay, this read, it is a two and a half on what is a seven mouthpiece. If you're coming back to my channel, you have seen me do the same altissimal things with the Giardinelli, it's like a four star mouthpiece, the uh, Yamaha 4C and 5C, the Ricoh Graftonite mouthpieces. It is important that you can do this inexpensively. So this is nothing exotic. As far as Rico goes, I will tell you being transparent, I have always struggled playing Altissimo with the Metalite mouthpieces. So if you're going to pick up one of the Ricos, my advice to you, if you're going for that uh, budget, the Graftonite. And mine is a C7, very run-of-the-mill, in-the-middle kind of thing. Okay, I need to tell you a little story about what I feel is the biggest issue with people's ability to play Altissimo and also their ability to have a good tone and a good sound on saxophone and it has to do with embouchure. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little story about Adolf Sax, the person who invented this instrument and what he was trying to do with inventing a saxophone. I'm gonna generalize this because I don't want the video to be 40 minutes long, but in short, he wanted to create an instrument that had a brass-like quality with woodwind fluidity, the technical speed and accuracy that you can get that punctuation definition of pitch that you can get with a woodwind instrument with the power of a brass instrument. Why do this? The orchestra's fine, right? Wrong. There was a big hole in orchestras and it was in the low end, the bass, acoustic bass, string bass has a way of not punctuating notes. So if he could create a woodwind instrument that had this type of fluidity, this would be a genius, genius invention. If you go online and you look up the instrumentation of a 50 to a 100 piece orchestra, you're gonna notice two, maybe even three trumpets. You're gonna notice two, maybe even three trombones. I'm picking on trumpets and trombones because they have a bell that points toward the audience. And this is humongous because there are not very many instruments in the orchestra that do that. And the fact that they are all the way in the back is telling you something about how powerful these instruments are. French horn, there's usually six, six French horns. However, the bell is pointing backwards and their hand is in the bell. This creates a type of acoustic balance. The instrument is so loud and so powerful, you gotta point it in the wrong direction and stick your hand in the bell in order to get acoustic balance. Tuba, euphonium, bells are pointing upward. As far as woodwind instruments go, flutes do not have a bell. Clarinets, the bells are pointing downward. Double reeds, oboe, English horn, bells are pointing downward. Bassoon, the bell is tiny, it's skinny, and it's pointing upwards. There is no woodwind instrument whose bell is actually pointing forward in an orchestra, except one. <laughs> the saxophone. The saxophone's bell is humongous by comparison of the size of the instrument. Let's take a look. I can barely get to the entire thing in this shot, but newer saxophones I'm seeing 
The bell and the bow is one piece, so it's even larger. So the air, the liter capacity of air of the bell of a saxophone is almost the size of the entire saxophone itself. The bell of a saxophone points toward the audience, which means this instrument is going to be very, very loud. One badly placed Leo P in the center of a 100 piece orchestra can completely dominate the entire acoustic capacity of a 100 piece orchestra. Why? Because the bell is humongous and it's pointed at the audience. How do you tame that? You tame that by using something similar to a clarinet embouchure. Now, Adolf Sax was a genius. So the method he applied to playing saxophone uses what is essentially a clarinet embouchure. This really is the equivalent of a French horn whose bell is pointed in the opposite direction with the hand in the bell. You can greatly acoustically balance this instrument and keep in mind the first one that he made was a bass sax whose bell is ginormous. So if you have that instrument, in the bass section now, you got this thing that's doing something with the bass that you ain't never heard before. Berlioz lost his mind. He was like, oh, damn, son. What is that? Berlioz lost his mind. He was like, oh, damn, son. What is that? <laughs> the whole point of me going on that giant tirade is to point out the fact that the standard saxophone embouchure that we're taught as kids that we use is horrifyingly inefficient outside of that ensemble. Outside of that ensemble, this thing gets demolished, especially in a big band where you got four, possibly five trumpets. Five. We only had two or three in a 100 piece symphony orchestra. And we only had two or three trombones. Now we got four and then an addition of a bass trombone. Oh, son. Plus, now we got a rhythm section. We got drums. We have bass that's amplified. We got a piano that's going through an amplifier. We got a guitar that's going through an amplifier. This instrument gets demolished, completely destroyed. So we need to alter the mute. We need to take our foot off the brake so that we can go faster. Okay, so this is all the stuff that I'm talking about when it comes to a lip out saxophone embouchure. And number one, number one, number one, you need to lower the tip opening of your mouthpiece and start rolling your lip out. The best way that I can suggest that you get started is take the mouthpiece and the neck and overdo it. Blow it as you would blow into a straw. <laughs> yeah, it's insanely loud. Here's the standard way. First thing you want to do to learn a lip out embouchure, and this seven is really too open for you to start with. I would suggest you start with a lower tip opening mouthpiece. Keep your reeds around the two to two and a half. The standard clarinet embouchure, the standard saxophone embouchure that we use, lip over the teeth. Even when I'm blowing harder, it's not getting much louder. Now I'm gonna use a lip out as though I just have a straw, like a regular drinking straw, and I just blow into it as hard as I can. Cover your ears for this, by the way. The difference is humongous. It's humongous. If you play like that in a symphony orchestra, you're not going to play like that for very long in a symphony orchestra. Now, you notice that the pitch was considerably lower. So you're going to need to push your mouthpiece 
in farther. And you may need to work your way out. Start with it in, work your way out. Practice that. When we start to apply that to playing the saxophone, you notice that I'm not pinching off the reed's ability to oscillate. That's the whole point. We are freeing up this extra space here that we call a facing curve so that we can get a much bigger sound. We aren't pinching the sound off in the upper register. We aren't pinching the sound off when we want to play louder. Now, how do I actually apply this to playing higher notes, higher overtones? I'm going to show you a secret here. This is amazing. Watch this. High G on alto and tenor is a very unstable note. More so on tenor than on alto, but everything I'm showing you works on both alto and tenor. So don't worry about it. I want to apply less embouchure pressure on a high G. And let's hear what happens. I destabilized that note by using less embouchure pressure. The volume also increased, and also there's another harmonic that started to sound. That other harmonic is an out of tune palm D. That note is sharp. 99% of the time, when you squeak out a high G, you're actually popping out that really out of tune palm D. This is the same technique that I use to play altissimo because I've relaxed my embouchure. When I apply pressure to my embouchure to get higher notes, it's not going straight up and down. Because remember, if we apply that straight up and down, we are effectively shortening the tip opening of the mouthpiece. So instead of going up and down, I go into the heart of the reed, still keeping the tip opening free so that the reed can vibrate or oscillate to its maximum potential. So it goes without saying, ladies and gentlemen, that I do have some merchandise available. See, I got this t-shirt here. I got my All Things Diminished book here. I got some altissimo fingerings for diminished scales and that. And obviously, I have my two altissimo books, both of which are available as a digital purchase only. There will be a link in the description for those. Also, for our mouthpieces and stuff like that, I do have a Woodwind, Brasswind affiliate link. You can click on that and browse around. And I'm telling you right now, they are always, always running some kind of special. So make sure that you take care of that. We are often taught to use overtones and overtone techniques in order to learn altissimo. I mostly think this is a complete and total waste of time if your embouchure is still just shortening the tip opening of the mouthpiece. Okay, that's all I got for you, ladies and gentlemen, so stay tuned. See ya!